Welcome to the presentation on core software design principles for programmers. My name is Venkat Subramaniam. We're going to talk about some principles that I've found to be extremely useful when it comes to designing software. So I'll talk a little bit about why we should focus on some of these principles, and then we will get into some of the uh, principles themselves. So one of the things that I find fascinating is when we try to develop software, we contend with quite a number of problems. We want to make the code extensible. We want to make the code maintainable. We want the code to be easier to understand. So there are several different goals we try to often meet when it comes to developing software. But unfortunately, though, it really becomes really hard to maintain code when we have a lot of code. And one way to make code extensible, actually, is to try to keep the design minimalistic, simple, as much as we can. But I found that there are certain principles that can help us to develop better quality software. Well, oftentimes when, as programmers, we get really excited about talking about software design principle uh, patterns. And I think design patterns are very useful, definitely beneficial. But unfortunately, when we look at design patterns in isolation, it really becomes hard to find what pattern actually makes sense to use. And we end up actually using wrong set of patterns. And that only ends up complicating the design. However, when it comes to looking at design patterns, if we can try to understand what some of the design principles are the forces behind those patterns, then I think we can make a better choice of whether those design patterns actually make sense if those design principles are not the real force behind our particular design concern. Maybe then those design patterns are not really applicable. Or on the other hand, if the design principles and the patterns uh, behind the force behind the patterns are very similar to each other, and maybe that's the right candidate. So I consider design principles to be a lot more fundamental and valuable, and then come back to think about design patterns seems to be much more beneficial in my, in my experience. So where do we see them? We see them almost constantly as we work with code. Almost every corner we turn, we can see these particular principles being either applied or being violated. Knowing these principles has been very valuable in using a good vocabulary when communicating with the team. So we can uh, talk about, hey, here you are violating this particular principle, or why don't we apply this principle in this context? So it can be a nice vocabulary for communication. And why use them? Because I find these principles are very beneficial from the point of view cre of creating a better quality software themselves. But then the question is, when do I typically see these patterns being used? I, I consider design to be a two-phased design. One I consider as a strategic design, and another as more of a tactical design. A strategic design is a very high-level design uh, where we try to get an overall understanding, have a vision for how to actually implement this particular software. And uh, once we have a strategic design, a tactical design is something that we can constantly use to evolve the strategic design and, and turn it in the right direction. And I often use tactical design during test-driven development. So as I'm writing a code along with TDD, I often end up using these kinds of design principles during the tactical design phase. Well, having said that, let's talk about some really good core design principles that can be very useful for us to uh, program with. Now, the very, very first principle I want to talk about is probably a principle we see almost constantly being violated, which is called the dry principle. The pragmatic programmers talked about this in the, program, in the, in the book Pragmatic Programmers. And, and this essentially is a principle that talks about avoiding duplication. So the dry principle says we should definitely try our best to avoid duplication. But it is not just a duplication of code, but it's a duplication of effort as well. Oftentimes, people think that this is only about code duplication, but more so, it's about effort duplication. So the dry principle really says uh, every knowledge. So you are really looking at the knowledge in the systems. And because what do we normally do? Well, we are knowledge workers. We are implementing various rules, logic, information, knowledge. That's what we do in code. We constantly are implementing knowledge in code. And it says every knowledge in a system so in a system should have, and they're talking about a single authoritative representation. So essentially, the idea is every knowledge in a system should have a single uh, and unambiguous authoritative representation. So essentially, um, the idea behind this is ambiguous. So the idea behind this is we really want to be able to 
put our fingers and say, that's where that core logic is being handled in one single place. Now, we see the dry principle being violated so many times in so many cases. And almost everybody I know uh, is at fault, me included. Uh, I was working on an application where we had a system which was dealing with a fairly complex amount of logic, but if you send a wrong piece of data to it, it would crash. And in my eagerness to prevent this particular crash, and I had no control over that system, I had implemented a logic to say, if you enter this data, sorry, user, you cannot enter this. This is not permitted. Well, a few months later, the people working on the other system fixed the problem. And then, of course, when they tried to enter this data, my code would say, don't do this. And then they filed a bug saying, you got to fix it. Well, it turns out, in my eagerness to fix this problem, every single user interface where I took this data, I had performed a validation. So it took us several months to go find all these places and fix it, which is really a bad idea because it's been duplicated in so many places, in this case, as a code, and a lesson learned, and you eventually learn about you know, some poor practices. And this can be seen in quite a number of places all the time. I was talking to a developer, and he once said, well, on our project, every two months, we fix the same bugs. I said, oh my gosh, did somebody actually put the bugs back when you fix it? He said, no, this code has been duplicated in so many places, we keep discovering it. And I said, how does it feel? He said, it really sucks. And I said, well, when you do find this uh, duplicated code, you take a few minutes to refactor and remove the duplication, right? And he thought for a minute and said, that's a great idea, right? Of course, what, what would happen if you never ever do this, right? There is no way to improve on it. So we have to take the time to remove such duplication. But it's not just duplication of code, but it's a duplication of effort. Oftentimes, it's easy for us to say, oh, yeah, this is not really a duplication, but really, is it or is it not? Is something we have to think about. For example, if you have ever seen a particular change request come in, and because of the change request, you change the database schema, you change the class over here, you change the controller over there, you change the interface over here. Well, none of those are duplicated code, but that one single change rippled through the system, that's a duplication of effort, and we have to rethink about it. So let's look at one example of this. There are quite a few tools that do this, but this is just to give you an example of how does it feel to be able to do something like this. So I'm going to uh, use an example here from uh, Grails. And Rails does this, Grails does this, quite a number of tools actually do this for us, so we can take a look at how this is actually going to work. So in this case, I'm going to have a little class called team, and the team class essentially focuses on some metadata or domain data. So all I'm going to do here simply is to say string name of a team and a string contact, let's say, are the two properties that I have implemented right here for the team itself. Now, I'm interested certainly in taking a look at how this particular team can be uh, used in the UI. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up the little browser here and take a look at the uh, page. So if you notice in this particular case, it's using an in-memory database. It's going to blow it away. That's perfectly fine. But I'm going to go to the team controller here for a minute. And if I create a new team, for instance, you can see it takes the contact and the name, as you can see here. Well, I'm going to say team one, for example. I could say team one is the contact. We could create it. Well, this is a create page, as you can see. That's one page. But I can also go to the team list here, and I can click on Edit, and I'm changing the current name as it is. That is the edit page. You can see two different pages being active at this point. However, I want to implement a certain rule, a certain logic. And the rule I want to implement is that there is no duplication of names. In other words, I want to maintain uniqueness, let's say. So all I'm going to do here is simply say that name is going to be unique and it's true. And that's exactly one single place where I've specified that particular rule, as you can see in this particular case. That's all, that's all I did. Well, having done this one single change, you can see that this actually is going to be replicated automatically in multiple places, avoiding the duplication of effort that I was mentioning a few minutes ago. So in this particular case, of course, uniqueness of a data requires a check on the server side, because obviously the data is on the database, which is on the server. So this is a server side validation, nevertheless. So as a result, as you can see in this particular case, if I were to go back here to create a particular team, and in this case, of course, I say team one, and I'm going to simply say team one right here and create. Well, if I go back to create a new team one more time, and I say team one, nevertheless, in this case, you can see that it's going to immediately tell me that I'm not allowed to create a team with the same name. 
But not only is this actually possible in the new, I can also say team two, for example, but on the other hand, if I go back to the edit page, and in the edit page, try to go back and change this to team one, we get exactly the same error. So it doesn't matter which angle you visit this, the validation still kicks in. And the way that this validation actually kicks in is actually through this particular one configuration, a single authoritative, unambiguous representation. But of course, a lot of times, it's easy for us to say, well, that was a simple example, but my needs are different. Well, all our needs are always different. What if you want to do a validation on the client side? Well, we all can agree about one thing. You never do validation only on the client side. You always do it on both sides, client and the server. Well, the reason, of course, is you can bypass the client validations much more easily. Of course, the server should still catch the problems and say this is not allowed. So what if you have to do client validation and server validation? Well, sure, on the server side validation, we could be using the right principle, and you could say, here's the Java code I'm writing or whatever language you're using. But on the client side, of course, usually it's a very different language. Maybe I'm using a JavaScript. Oh, see, this is two different languages. Obvi obviously, I have to duplicate the code. Well, that's one way to think about it. Or we can argue, maybe we don't have to duplicate the code. Maybe we can still create a single authoritative representation and then have that other piece of code maybe auto-generated from that particular logic. Well, what would happen if you set up a code like that? It would take a little bit of effort to do that code generation, but as time comes to maintain this code, it becomes really easy to make a change in one single place all the time. So for example, in this case, I'm going to say contact is going to be email, and I'm going to specify that this is email is true. And notice that I only made one single change one more time for this particular problem. But if I go back here this time again, and if I go back to the team, and if I were to create a new team one more time, I say team one, if I just say team one, you can see the validation already kicks in and tells us we are not allowed to just use team one. We are required to give a particular format for this because it's actually an email address. So you can see the validation is kicking here on the client side uh, very quickly. But of course, a server side validation will happen as well. But all of that was generated from that one single place uh, in this particular case. So the point really is that we really want to be able to avoid this duplication as much as we can, because the more duplication we have in code, we really have more trouble to create it. Like I said, I can't really create a better quality software all the time, but I try really hard. But there are times when I actually end up creating a, a, a code in a, in a better way. And one such example was recently I was working on a project, and I had maybe six months ago done something a little bit better. I had refactored the code, and I removed the duplication. On the day that I had to really sit and edit this particular code to enhance it, I came in to see that all that code is nicely tucked away, and all I have to do is simply reuse that code. And, and that moment when you realize, gosh, this is actually much better. I don't have to struggle at this level. And so to me, there is one important reason to create better quality software. So if you create a good software, there is one huge benefit that you have, the future uh, you uh, 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 that is, uh, uh, thanks you. And that's actually something really, really important, right? So if you create a better quality software, the future you is going to thank you. You definitely don't want the future you to be cursing you. And, and usually that happens a lot, isn't it? It's even worse when our colleagues curse us. But if you, if you really create a better software, the future you is actually going to thank you because you're like, oh, that was a good decision we made. We don't have to struggle on this day because of that decision. So little things like this can add up very quickly. So it's well worth doing that over time. So given this, we talked about the dry principle. This is one of my favorite principles, which is called the Yagni principle. And the Yagni principle says, you aren't going to need it. Now, think about this for a minute. How many times we create code and we bloat systems when we really don't need as much code as we have actually written? Now, here's one problem. If you go to developers and you tell them you're not going to need it, oftentimes they get very apprehensive. So I normally say, you are not, not going to need it yet. And that little yet is so pleasing to developers. Can I do this tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, that's OK. We'll think about it tomorrow, right? So you're not going to need it yet is much better than you're not going to need it, in my opinion. But why are you not going to need it? Well, the reason is, 
oftentimes we implement so much code with the assumption we need something, and we really end up seeing that that assumption is not true, but all that code has been written and it becomes a maintenance problem over time. I was actually pairing with the programmer not too long ago as we were writing test and writing code, test and writing code. In the middle of me writing the code, I said to myself, oh, wait a minute, I got to take care of this situation, and I started writing a little code. He immediately elbowed me and said, hey, don't you think you have to wait until you write a failing test for that condition? Aren't we not implementing something else? So like, I, well, you're right, uh, absolutely. And I removed what I was writing and focused on the current test. Once we got this done, we wrote the other test to validate this particular uh, you know, condition. And as soon as we wrote the test and run the test, the test actually ended up passing. So we both were a little surprised. We said, how does this test pass without having to write this code? And that's when we realized that the underlying library is already handling that case, and the code I was going to write was absolutely redundant. Now, when it comes to features, oftentimes we as programmers do this a lot. We anticipate a lot of things. We claim extensibility, and we write a lot of code. And what happens usually is when those conditions are not true, that code becomes the baggage we have to carry a long way. It becomes very painful. So in other words, when it comes to writing code, it is important to postpone writing code as much as you can. Now, hands down, the code you did not write has the fewest number of bugs in it, right? Absolutely. And I would say this is what experience really is. When you're a very young uh, um, employee and you're just starting out programming, you have the desire to go to work and write a lot of code. After 15, 20 years of experience, you go to work to avoid writing code, right? That is what you learn over time, because you know the code you don't write is the code you don't have to maintain. And you try to figure out a way to reduce the code you actually write. And that's basically what Yagni is. This also comes to the point where oftentimes you go to programmers and you ask them what are they doing, and they're busy writing the code, and you ask them, do you understand the requirements? They say, I don't have a clue what the requirements are, but I've got a deadline to finish this code, right? So we often write code. We don't care what the user wants, but I got code to write today. And this is something we have to strive really hard. Well, if you are in the US, you know one thing. In the US, when you go to a restaurant and sit down to eat, they would give you so much food, you would be really, really shocked. Oftentimes, when I sit down to eat in the restaurants, I often wonder, why are they feeding me so much? Is this my last meal? It feels like that, right? They want to give us so much food. And on the other hand, I went back from one of the uh, trips, and I was really starved. I sat down in a restaurant and I said, I want to order food. And he gives me a menu, and I said, I want this, 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 and this. And in a very straight face, this guy asked me, who else is eating with you? I said, no, I'm alone. I'm sitting here. I'm going to eat. He said, and all this food is for you. He said, uh-huh. He said, I won't serve you. I got really upset for a minute. He said, what do you mean you won't serve me? He said, well, here's the deal. You tell me two items you want, and when you're done eating it, and if you still want, I will serve you the other two items with absolutely no extra charge. I said, oh, that's an interesting challenge. He served me the two things, and I could even only eat half of what he served. And of course, that was a lesson learned. But not all the time you have businesses that are as smart as he was, or as you know, ethical as he was to say, you're wasting your money and food. I don't want to serve you. Well, programmers should have a courage not to write code when they haven't fully understood what they need to write. And so the idea here is to postpone to the last responsible moment. Last responsible moment is a time when you want to postpone it until you no longer can postpone it. It's a difference from procrastination. Procrastination is where you have not done something that should have been done already. Postponing to the last responsible moment is doing it any sooner is not necessary. Postponing it any further wouldn't be possible. Now, it is very important to postpone it, but why? Well, I think most of us can agree to this fact. You are smarter tomorrow than you are today. Does anybody not agree with that? Do you think you're smarter today, uh, tomorrow than you are today? Absolutely, right? There was only one guy I came across ever who said no. He said, no, I'm smarter today than tomorrow. Nobody liked him. So the point really is that we absolutely really want to postpone until because we have more information moving forward than we do today, than we do at this moment. So postpone decisions until a later time. Well, this next principle is actually also a very important principle. We see this constantly being violated. It is called the single responsibility principle. One thing we do really badly in programming is we bring two or more 
independent ideas into one place. And when you mix things together, it becomes extremely problematic. So what does single responsibility principle really say? It says the code we write should be narrow, focused, and do one thing and one thing well. I'll give you a real life example of what this cohesion really means. Cohesion means like things are together and unlike or dislike things are away from each other. So when I was a kid, my, my parents, poor parents, really had a very tough time raising me. I would come back from school, I was always eager to go out and play on the streets. I would run home and immediately I'll throw things into a little cupboard and run away. And if you open the cupboard ever, I don't know what you will see in there. Everything is jumbled up. I'll have my books in there, I'll have my sock, I'll have my clothes, everything mixed together. Which was really fun because it was fast to throw things in than put them in order. But if you really wanted a blue sock, the next sock you will find will not be blue in color. So the retrieval was extremely slow, but I never realized it. I kept the home as a mess all the time. And everything will be everywhere. I can never find anything. It was a complete disarray. Socks is everywhere, books everywhere, everything everywhere. You may say, my gosh, that looks scary. What happened? How did you change? Well, I got married. Okay, so that fixes everything, right? So the point is, yeah. So, so the point really is, now if you notice, the socks are in one place and definitely not in the kitchen. And then of course, the books are in another place, far away from the kitchen. And so there is this nice, beautiful way things are kept. And as a result, that's basically what cohesion is all about. So the idea is that you keep light things together, dislikes and things away, and that's basically what you do with cohesion. It is a single responsibility principle. Where do things belong? But we see this being violated all the time, long methods, right? So long methods, let's talk about this for a minute. Who here, raise your hand if you do, thinks that long methods are a good idea? Raise your hand if you think it is. Not a single person I can see. One person, there's always one. So usually I would ask, why do you think so? And that one person would say, because long methods are faster. You know what, that is somewhat true, but the last time it was 100% true was when Nixon was the president. A lot of things have changed since then. Different architecture, different compiler technology. So, so many things are very different. But let me ask you a different question to you and raise your hand if you see long methods at your work. Notice that, right? This is called cognitive dissonance. Everybody knows not to do it, but you see this happening all the time. But I'll tell you why you see long methods. Because I know nobody in this room writes long methods, because you know that's not, a bad, that's not a good idea. If you thought it was a good idea, except one person, nobody raised the hand, so you know it's not a good idea, right? So why are you seeing long methods? The reason is the people who are writing the long methods are at work today, making those methods longer as we speak. There is nothing we can do about it, right? So we know it's a bad idea, but the rest of the people don't get it. But why is it such a wrong thing to do? Why are long methods such a bad idea? Well, well, long methods have several problems in them. Well, long methods are, guess what? They are long, so what's gonna happen? They are hard to read. Have you ever had a reason to read a long method? I, I'm a consultant, I travel around uh, for different companies. One time I had a company that say, come and help us review the code and help us to find a problem. I started reading the code, and I started reading this method. I had probably re read about five, 10 lines of code, and I was curious, I've read 10 lines, but I'm still reading how much more there is. So I started using the arrow to go down. It keeps going brrrr. And then I said, that's not working. Page down, and it's still going. And that didn't stop either. Then I went up and I took the curly braces, and I did the comparison of that, and I did a little math to compare the line numbers. 7,000 lines long in that one method. I'm like, where's the nearest exit, right? I wanna run. So the point is, it becomes extremely hard to read this code when it is very long like this. What are other reasons? Hard to understand, isn't it? Any other reasons? Aha, uh -huh, hard to debug. Who debugs this code? They are called victims, right? <laughs> we, we come in and start debugging the code, absolutely, it's hard and hard to reuse. How do you reuse this monster? What you want is that five lines of code in the middle, and you're like, it, it's there, but I can't get to it. So what do you do? 
leads to duplication, isn't it? Copy and paste it, sweet. Into another long method, right? And so this leads to duplication of code as well. What else happens? Hard to test. The number of permutation and combination you have to go through is enormous. You cannot absolutely keep up with it. So what do you do? You leave the testing to where it rightly belongs, to the users, right? <laughs> so like, I can handle this. So what do you do then? So it is very hard, well, leads to, lacks cohesion. What is cohesion? Cohesion is where a code is narrow, focused, and does one thing and one thing well. What does a long method do? It says, I do everything. You got anything more for me, right? It's very, very large, very hard to maintain. And often, it also has very high coupling. You think it's gonna be alone doing this? It's gonna invite the party, everybody to the party, right? It's gonna have a very long, large coupling as well, becomes extremely hard to, to understand, to read. So long methods, we can keep going with this list of so many ways it is really wrong. But have you noticed one thing before? Have you ever seen this? You see a long method, so there's a lot of lines of code, over and over and over, and suddenly you would see a little comment right there in the middle. And then you would see this long code, and then you would see comment again. Then a long code, and then you see a comment again. Have you ever seen that before? You, do you know why you see this pattern? I have a reasoning, finally, why you see this pattern. The reason why you see long methods with comments like this is the person who wrote the code is a bad programmer, but not a bad human being. At the very depth of their heart, they have empathy. They say, what if some clown ever has to read this code, right? So those places are really good targets for refactoring. And we can just take that away and extract the method out of it. So that's basically what you get. You say, okay, Venkat, we got it. We understand writing long methods are a bad idea, and we would not do it. But the problem, as you said, is not us. The problem is those programmers at work writing long methods now, what do we do? Well, you can try to explain to them, but if they don't get it, I'll give you one last help, just one last help. Go to work on Monday morning. Don't say a word. Sit down and start working away. And as you're working, your colleague, the one who writes long methods, comes over and says, hey, how was your weekend? You could say the following. You could say, oh, the weekend was great. I went to the park on Saturday with the kids, and I went to the movies on Sunday. But don't say that. Instead, you say, oh, the weekend. At exactly 7 o'clock, I got into the car, pulled the car out of the garage, took a left turn, and go, go, went about two kilometers, stood at the stop sign, took a left turn, and then, oh, there was a bird on the uh, wall, by the way, and then I went for another three miles, and then took a right turn, drove exactly for 30 seconds, and then took a left turn again, and then I took a right turn, and then I would go for, keep going like this as long as you can. And eventually, your colleague says, have you gone mad? You say, no, I thought I'll tell you how my weekend was like you write code, right? So the point is, we don't communicate like this to people. What you say is, I went to the park on Saturday and movie on Sunday, and your colleague could say, oh really, what park did you go to? Is the park family friendly? What kind of attractions do they have over there? Notice we are going down the path of the park, not really focusing on the movie. Well, this is the way we communicate with humans. Well, guess what? Writing code is a way to communicate as well. So what this really means is, we need to really think about a different way. So one thing you can do to write better code is SLAP. No, don't do this to programmers. This actually stands for single level of abstraction principle. So the idea behind single level of abstraction is every piece of code should have one level of abstraction. What did you do on the weekend? Went to the park on Saturday, the movie on Sunday. You didn't tell what part, you didn't say what movie, whether it was a comedy or tragedy, you don't go into those details, one level of detail at the top level. You wanna know more about the park, we come down that way, you wanna know more about the movie, we come down that way. So here's another way to think about it. What is a long method? Oftentimes people ask us, what's a long method? Well, you could argue maybe 100 lines is long. Well, the, some programmers would say 100 lines, that's too much. I would say 20 lines is long. A third programmer may say 20 lines is too long, I would say 10 lines. But how do you really know how many lines is actually reasonable? Well, it, forget the number of lines of code, let's redefine that. If you can see the entire function in a window, then it is small enough. 
That doesn't work either, because the minute I say it, the programmers ask me, what, what font size are you using? Right? That doesn't help either. So rather than that, let's talk about not the number of lines of code, but the levels of abstraction. A method is long if it is dealing with more than one level of abstraction. And that's basically what single level of abstraction principle says, is focus your methods on one single level of abstraction. That's basically what this is about. And so what you do is you create what is called a composed method pattern. And the idea behind the composed method pattern is we focus on one level of abstraction, and this reads like a set of things you would do, a steps to do, and then each of those steps can be provided into a lower level at a different time. Well, the next principle I want to talk about here is called the open-closed principle. The open-closed principle says a software module must be open for extension, but closed from modification. Now, that sounds like a magic. How could you keep something open for extension, but closed for modification at the same time? Well, the idea behind this is we want to create extensible software, but how do we really create extensible software? But before I talk about some of these principles, I want to emphasize you have to really use these principles only in places where it makes absolute sense. Because if we use these principles when it doesn't make much sense, we actually end up violating some of these principles and making the code more complex. So we have to use a grain of salt in deciding it. So let's look at an example of the open-closed principle and where that would make a, a big difference. So let's say for a minute, I have a class called car, and I'm going to say car equals new car. Well, in this case, I'm going to say 2015, and I'm going to create maybe a little engine here. We'll call it car engine, and I'm going to create this particular abstraction. And when I'm done with it, I'm going to simply say in here, you know, print the details of this, let's say car one. Well, that's great, but I do want to create the car itself. But how do I go about creating it? Well, that should be easy, but we'll come to that. Let's create the car engine for a minute. So I have the class car engine, and within this, I'm going to simply provide, let's say, a toString method. And I'm going to simply return, let's say, in this case, get class. Well, plus, let's also return, let's say, the hash code, just to see what the hash code details are. We know about hash code. If it's the same, we can tell much about the difference. But if it's different, we know the objects are actually different. Well, then, of course, I can create a car class itself. In this particular case, I can say, well, this is going to contain a year. We'll call it the year. And it's going to contain the engine. So those are the two properties I want to create. Well, let's go ahead and put the uh, engine over here and the year property. So here is the year. And I'm going to save the engine as well, let's say. We're going to create those two different fields. Well, having created these fields, I'm going to just output one more time in this case. So very quickly to uh, output this, I'm going to say return. Well, let's return the uh, year of the car. And then, of course, followed by, let's say, I want to return the engine of the car as well. Well, that should be quite plenty for us to work with. So if I run this code reasonably, the car should display the year and the engine value. So it seems like that's working just fine. But what if I really want to make a copy of this car? So car 2 equals new car, car 1, let's say. And then, of course, I'm going to output car 2. Well, of course, in this case, we can see that Java does not allow us a copy constructor. Well, the reason is, of course, copy constructors was a mess in C++. And they said, we're not going to give you this by default. Well, we could try to create a copy constructor, obviously. So in this case, I have a other car. And in this case, of course, I'll say the year is equal to other car's year, obviously. But what about the engine? Well, equal to other cars. In this case, I don't want to say the engine, absolutely, because this would end up copying a reference to the other engine. We don't want that to be shared. We want two different engines being available. So one way to fix this, I'm going to say, is new engine. And in this case, we will say engine. And we'll simply call this as the other dot engine. So we make a copy of the engine from the other class's engine. Well, obviously, for this purpose, we need a copy constructor in this particular case. We'll call it other. And of course, you would do whatever is necessary here, but I don't really have anything to copy at this point. But in a sense, you would, generally speaking. And then, of course, this is the regular constructor we would need as well. Well, that seems reasonable so far. Let's go ahead and run this little code. And you can see, in this case, you have two instances. The year uh, is the same, but the engines are different. Life is wonderful. Everything is actually working fine. But work, what could be the problem in cases like this? Well, extensibility is often a problem. Let's say for a minute, we're going to say a car engine 
and I'm going to say engine equals new, let's say turbo engine for a minute. So I got a new class here called a turbo engine. So I've created this class called turbo engine which extends from engine. I've got the regular constructor in here. I have also have the copy constructor uh, in here as well. So now that I have those two guys available, let's get back to this code and say, well, I don't want to really pass a car engine. I'm going to instead pass a turbo engine. Well, because a turbo engine extends from a car engine, the compiler will absolutely have no problems with this whatsoever. Notice it doesn't complain at this time. But on the other hand, unfortunately, if I run this code, very sad notice, while the first car has a turbo engine, the second car contains a regular car engine. So we need to really fix that mess. In other words, we must be able to handle the different types of engine. But thankfully, it's not very difficult to fix it. So rather than doing this, we can quickly say if the other car's engine is instance of the uh, you know, engine, car engine, right? Well, turbo engine. Then we could say, of course, the engine is going to be equal to turbo engine. And then this is going to be the other car, well, new, pardon me. So this is going to be new, uh, remove this part. So new turbo engine. And then, of course, the casting comes in here. So this is going to be turbo engine and other dot engine. So uh, otherwise, of course, we're not done else. Then we say the engine is equal to new engine. Uh, and then, of course, this is going to be the um, uh, other engine. So other dot the engine. So having done this, as you can see here, when you go back and run this code, if the engine was a turbo engine, you have a turbo engine in the output below, as you can see. But if you said car engine, on the other hand, you end up seeing both the cars are engine. So that was a very easy way to fix it. What do you think? You like it? No? Well, you always have to think about positive things. This is job security, right? This is job security. You can hold it for a very long time. Well, unfortunately, every time we add a new type of engine, we got to come and change it. Has anybody seen use of instance of in their code? How do you feel? Dirty, right? Well, what's going to happen when you have a lot of instance of in the code? Every time you add a new piece of code, you got to come and change it. If you feel that's bad, I'll tell you what is even better. You don't have one piece of code with instance of. You have the duplicated several places. That's more fun. Because when you add a new class, you got to go find every place where that instance of. I've actually seen code like that. And when you have instances of checks like this, it becomes very hard to extend code. So open closed principle says, every time you introduce a new abstraction or a new extension to the current feature, if you have to come and change code, that's a violation of the open closed principle. Now, why so? Well, here's the question. Option one, you have to change existing code. Option two, you have to write a little bit of new code. Which option do you prefer? Option two, absolutely. Why? Because nobody likes to change existing code. What is the first thing that happens when you open existing code? You start cursing, right? Is that true? You look at this code and say, who in the world wrote this code? What was this moron thinking? I was looking at a programmer recently. He was looking at a piece of code, and he was endlessly cursing until he realized he was the one who wrote it and doesn't remember. And it's like, oh my gosh, this doesn't look that bad anymore, right? So the point is, nobody likes to look at existing code. It takes effort to learn, understand, then modify. And when you change it, you're worried, what is it going to break? Open close principle says we should add a new module of code and not change existing code. Well, but how do we do this? Well, one way to do this is, rather than using this approach, we could rely on polymorphism. Well, new is not polymorphic. Well, there is something else that's polymorphic, which is methods of a class. I'm not going to use clone, because clone has problems in Java already. If you're curious about why clone sucks, take a look at effective Java, and they talk about why we should not use clone. Well, the problem really is not with clone itself. The problem is the way the clone is implemented in Java. That's where the real problem is. So what I'm going to do instead of that is I'm going to go back to the car engine. And in the car engine, 
I'm going to write a method, and I'm going to say in this case, a car engine, and in this case, I'll say a, a copy, and rather than clone, and that's a method I'm going to implement. So I'm going to say return in this case, and new, and I will return a car, a car engine and make a copy, use of a copy constructor. And I'm going to change the copy constructor to a protected uh, over here uh, particular case. So it's a protected method, so you cannot use it from outside, but you can use it from here very easily. Likewise, what I'm going to do is go to Turbo Engine, and in the Turbo Engine, overwrite the copy method, but here, say, return new Turbo Engine this, and I'm using the copy constructor. You can also do one more thing. You can use reflection to call the copy constructor. Then you don't need to implement copy engine in each of these classes. You can just leave it implemented at the base uh, itself. L much like what I did before, I make the turbo engine's cons copy constructor protected as well. So now that we have made those changes, if I go back to the car class itself, I'm going to simply say, well, the engine is equal to other dot the engine dot copy. I don't need to really deal with these kinds of instance of. We rely on abstraction and polymorphism. So those are very key features we rely upon constantly. So as a result, if I go back and run this code, you can see that these are turbo engines uh, versus uh, uh, car engine, depending on what you are passing, it knows to resolve itself properly. So the idea behind open close principle is rely upon abstraction and polymorphism, make the code extensible. So oftentimes when I work with developers, I would say, if you go this way, you'll be violating the open close principle. Or if we design this way, we can honor the open close principle. So open close principle was created by Bertrand Meyer, and he talks about how a software module must be open for extension, but closed from actually physical change modification. That's basically what he is recommending. Well, the next principle I want to talk about here is called the Liskov substitution principle. And this principle is probably one of the most important principles we can come across. And essentially what this principle is saying is inheritance uh, should be used only for substitutability. So the idea behind this is you should not, inheritance is one of the most misused concepts in programming. How many times we use inheritance when it really is not the right choice and we end up using inheritance for the wrong reasons? Why should inheritance be such, uh, used so reluctantly? The reason is inheritance should really be used for substitutability. What that really means is we can actually ask this question very easily. Um, do you, so if you want to use an object of A in the making of the object of B, use delegation. If you want to use an object of B in place of an object of A, uh, then, and only then, use inheritance. So in other words, do you want to use or do you want to be used? There's a very big difference between these two. Do you want to use a class? Use delegation. Do you want to be used as a class? Use inheritance. Inheritance should be used very, very reluctantly. I had a programmer come to me and say, I've got this swing application, and it's gone out of control. I'm not able to maintain this anymore. It is not doing what I expected to do. Can you help? And it's a code this gentleman has written. And I said, yeah, I'll take a look at it. I'm looking at this code. And what he had done is he had written a class that inherits from JPayne. And it was actually not JPayne, it was JPayne, because it just didn't work at all. After a lot of struggle, I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and finally understood this was not meant to be inherited at all. And using inheritance where it is not the right choice can lead to a lot of problems over time. So this principle says you should only use when it is substitutable. Now, why is that the case? And the reason is, Liskov substitution principle goes a step further. It says uh, a, a user of a derived class should, a user of a class should be able to use um, a, a derived class uh, without, so without uh, knowing the difference. So in other words, if I'm a user of a particular class, if you send me an object or derived class, as a user of the base class, I shouldn't ever know that you pass me a derived class. 
So as a user of a base class, I should be using this as a base class object, and the fact that it's a derived class object shouldn't matter to me. So in other words, in order for us to comply with this, there are quite a few stringent requirements that come out of it. And one of them is a derived class a service, meaning method. So derived class service or method uh, should meet certain very high requirements. So what this says is should require no more and promise no less than the corresponding uh, method of the base class. So essentially the idea behind this is if you are inheriting from a class, your derived class services should require no more and should promise no less than the corresponding service of the base class, which means if you're going to use a particular object, you have no constraints, no requirement. But if you want to inherit from a class, you are taking on a huge commitment. Everything you do must be compliant with the perceived behavior of the base class. You cannot just go out and say, I'm going to change my implementation and behavior randomly in my class. You cannot do that. It's a very, very restrictive situation. So let's think about a few examples in Java where this principle is either being used or the principle is actually being violated. So very important to keep a few things in mind in general. So let's think about one particular problem here, if you will. Let's say you have a class, a base class, and you have, let's say, a function uh, foo in this particular case, and you have the function foo. It doesn't throw any exception at this point. Now I say class derived, and derived is extending from base, so extends base. And in this case, of course, I'm going to say a public void foo throws e1. Well, you know this already. Java will not allow this particular code. And the reason why Java doesn't allow this is a derived class method is not allowed to throw a new exception that the base does not already throw. Why is that? And the reason is, as a writer of a code that uses the base class, what are you going to do? You're going to put catch block around the code and say, I am ready to catch these exceptions. But if somebody sends a derived object and that throws some other exception, this code is going to say, whoa, I never expected that come through. And it's going to be problematic for that code to handle it. So the code doesn't allow you to throw new exceptions. That's basically the reason for it. That's one example. Similarly, if a method is public or protected in the base class, you cannot make them more stringent in the derived class. So you cannot take a public method and make it protected. Or you cannot take a public or protected method and make them private. The compiler doesn't allow you to do. Why? Because you're being more restrictive, and they don't want to restrict it. In fact, that's why Java chose the word extend rather than restrict, because you really want to extend the behavior and not restrict in any way. But of course, there are other languages like C++ where you can pretty much take a public method and make it private, protected, change everything you want. Because in languages like C++, there's absolutely no morality. It's like living in the jungle, right? So you can do anything you want, but languages try to make a little, bit, a little things easier for us. Unfortunately, this is not always a pleasant case. There are times when this actually potentially goes wrong as well. So here is one example of this for you. Uh, in the case of Java, class stack, unfortunately, what does class stack actually do? Let's take a look at an example here. If I say stack uh, over here and take a look at the stack for a minute, well, very sadly, though, if you look at the stack, stack actually extends from vector. Now, what is wrong with this particular idea? Well, we know what a stack is. A stack is a LIFO, last in, first out. So if you have a stack, you can put something on the top. You can remove something from the top. What is a vector, though? You can take a vector. You can insert elements anywhere you want to. You can remove elements from anywhere you want to. So a vector is very different behavior than a stack. Well, for a stack, there is an invariant of a stack. What is the invariant of a stack? That you put stuff on the top, and you remove the stuff from the, from the top. But let's say what could go wrong. Well, there's these three fine gentlemen on the front row. Let's say he has a method that is receiving a vector, and he takes this vector and sends it to him. He takes this vector, does a little bit of work, and sends it to him. And he takes this vector and says, oh, nice vector, and he uses that. Now I come along, I take a stack, and I send it to him. What does he do? He says, thanks, Venkat, and passes it to him. He says, nice vector. He doesn't see it as a stack. So he sends it to him. What does he do? He takes the vector given to him and uses it. 
And the specter comes, stack comes back and says, stack, how's it going? And the stack says, not good. Don't do this to me again, right? And it feels it's been violated, right? So poor stack doesn't really feel good anymore. It says, please don't send, in, send me to him. It fears him from now on, right? Why? Because we completely violated the invariant of a stack. A stack is not a vector. Well, a stack could be implemented using a vector, but it is not a vector. So that's clearly a violation. Now, so we all can understand this. You will say, you know what, absolutely, I completely get it. I fully understand we shouldn't be doing that. So what should we do? Well, the answer is fairly simple. We should use more delegation and less of inheritance. But here comes the problem. Suppose you have a class called base, and let's say this base class has a function, let's say void f1, and we also have, let's say, another function, public int f2, and so whatever, whatever it does doesn't matter. Now you're told, create a class uh, called you know, uh, my class, and the requirement is, has f1, f2 just like in base and f3? Well, easy, you could simply say public avoid f3, you wrote it, but who wants to write f1 and f2? That's a lot boring, isn't it? So if you ask most programmers, what do you think is inheritance better than delegation, they would tell you delegation is much better. And then they will put the book aside and turn to the compiler, and what would they do? Use inheritance. Why? The reason is inheritance is so easy. So you can simply say extends base, and voila, you're done. How cool that is, right? So you don't want to spend your effort writing that code. It is so easy to use inheritance. In fact, this is such a common problem the most IDs actually provide you a way out of it. So if you look over here in the refactoring, you will actually notice a little thing called replace inheritance with delegation. So that's such a common problem, they actually gave you a tool to fix the mess. So if you look at that, you say, I want to fix those two methods, and in a blink of an eye, you can see that it created this particular class, and then it wrote F1 and F2 very quickly. You say, oh boy, this is great, but what if I don't have an IDE like that? Well, then find somebody who can type really fast. So the point is you can implement this using delegation rather than using inheritance. But still there is one problem in this code. Now because we use delegation, we're not violating Liskov substitution principle, but unfortunately, did you notice, we are violating the open-closed principle. How are we violating the open-closed principle? If I come to the base class now and change the method name from f1 to something else, whoops, we are in trouble. I got to come and change the, my class now because the function name is not f1 anymore. If I change the signature, if I make any change to the base class that will affect the, der derived, the, the, the class that's depending on it, that becomes a mess. Well, wouldn't it be nice if this can be done for us automatically so we don't have to really do this? Well, thankfully, the answer is yes, we can actually do this very easily without having to struggle with it. And I'm going to give you an example of that right here. So let's look at an example of a class that can do this for us. So the example I'm going to give you here is going to be an example of a class, uh, let's say, called worker. Now, the worker class, as you can see here, contains a method called work, and all that the work method is doing is simply print line, let's say, working. So if you notice here, I'm going to say define Joe equals new worker, and I'm going to simply say at this point, uh, Joe dot work to make sure it's actually working, and you can see that particular code is being called. So that's an example of a groovy code, very simple. But the point I want to really get to is about inheritance versus delegation. Delegation uh, is what we want to favor. So how do I use delegation? So to understand this, let's create a class called manager. Now, as you would uh, imagine, the manager is a class which does absolutely nothing. So this basic class is just a manager class. But this manager actually is, is pretty uh, smart. So if I can go to the manager and say work, well, obviously, that doesn't work right now, but we can try to fix this. But this manager is extremely smart. The manager says, uh, delegate, and then worker victim equals new worker, right? 
So if you notice now in this particular case, we are asking it to be delegated to this particular object in this, in this case. So we have a class called manager, and we are simply telling the manager, go ahead and delegate this for, to an object of worker in this particular case. So that's all we did at this point. So let me resolve the error here. So we're asking it to delegate. Oh, let's see what this is saying. It's giving me an error here on the delegate for some reason. So the idea behind this is we are actually asking it to delegate. Did I misspell it? D-E-L-E. -E. There you go. Uh, so delegate this to a particular object. And you can see that's coming in. So you can see how that can be routed. But the beauty of this is we are using delegation without violating the open, uh, the open close principle. So if I say analyze over here, you can see in this case we have an analyze method where the worker simply says analyze, uh, analyzing. So you can see I don't have to change the manager class. I can easily bring that into the picture. So this is purely a compile time meta programming in Groovy. The minute you put a delegate, it brings in the methods of the object which are not already present in your class, and so very tactfully brings it in. And the beauty is, because it's a compile time meta programming, if you modify the source code of the, ba of the worker class, when you recompile, it automatically injects the methods for you in the manager class. You don't have to recompile it. You don't have to recode it. So it becomes a lot easier for you to work with it. So that's an example of how languages can mature to provide these kinds of delegation model. Well, the last principle I want to talk about is called dependency inversion principle. And I'm going to talk about dependency inversion principle here, but I'm going to show you an example without even using a single line of code by just relating to the concepts over here. So uh, for this, I will use an example of uh, my first visit to the wonderful country of Norway. This was back in time when there were no cell phones, and uh, laptops were really new at that point, in fact. So I land in uh, Norway, and, and a beautiful country, but my very first trip, and I land there in the afternoon, I check into the hotel, and I look around, and there was no coffee maker in the room. And I'm a guy who's addicted to really bad coffee. So I went to the clerk and, at the, at the re uh, reception and said, there's no coffee maker in the room. And she said, we don't give you coffee makers. So I argued with her until she said, you can have mine, take it away. And so now I had a wonderful coffee maker to make bad coffee with. Well, it comes rolling. It was evening. I need to you know, go to bed. I'm a guy who you know, sleeps in reasonable time, gets up pretty early in the morning. So I went, uh, you know, I was getting ready to sleep, and I look around the room, and I was a bit uh, in, a, in a bit of a panic because I look around the room and there was no clock in the room. And I thought to myself, what the, what's the matter with these hotels? They don't give you anything. Maybe that starts with a C. No coffee maker, no clock. So I went to the receptionist and said, "Well, I got a problem." She said, "What's it now?" I said, "Well, there's no clock in the room." And she said, "Yeah, we don't give you clocks." And I said, "Well, I got a problem because." I need a clock in the morning to wake up. And she looked very confused. She said, why do you need a clock in the morning to wake up? I said, you see, by my bedside, I have this clock. And early in the morning, it'll such, make such a horrible noise, I cannot sleep for the rest of the day. So I need my clock to wake me up, so I need a clock. And she said, oh, I understand what you're saying. You mean you want an alarm? I thought a minute and said, lady, don't get technical on me. Well, I, and, and I thought about it for a minute and said, OK, she's got a point. What I really need is an alarm and not a clock. I said, OK, fine, but do you have a clock? And she said, we don't give you a clock. Do you have an alarm? And I said, yes, there's an alarm in your room. I said, really? I did not see one. Well, did you turn on the TV? I said, no, I don't watch TV. Well, this week you will. So I went back to my room, and I turned on my TV. And it said, welcome to the hotel, Venkat. This is your alarm, too. And I was fascinated. This is awesome. What all do they have in TV these days? I've not watched one in a long time. So I kind of played with I'm a huge fan of test-driven development. So I set the alarm for two minutes from then, turn it off, and wait for two minutes. I want to make sure it's working. So two minutes later, it turns on. And it was weird. It turned on to CNN. Anyway, I changed the channel and wanted to make sure, and then set it again for another three minutes. Wait, it seems to work. Came back on CNN. But anyway, the next morning, I'm in a complete darkness. Now, you should imagine the plight I had. It was a completely dark room. I wake up in rooms where I don't remember where I am, like this morning. So anyway, I'm in a complete dark room, and now I hear a voice. And I open my eyes, complete darkness, with the light in the corner of the room, with the volume increasing every second. I'm in the panic now. I jump out of the bed, trying to find out where am I, 
why is the TV on? Where is my remote? And I turn around and look at the TV, and I'm in an absolute panic. There's a guy in suspender saying, hi, this is Larry King Live. Can you imagine waking up to Larry King Live? I had to go into counseling for a week after that. So now that I was awake in the morning, I was thinking about this. I said, this lady is awesome. She taught me a lesson in programming. She said, here's a concrete person depending on a concrete clock, and that's a very poor coupling. That's all the lesson she taught me in those wonderful moments. And then she said, what you really, really want is a concrete person should really depend not on a concrete clock, but you depend on an alarm. So now a clock, of course, is a derived instance from the alarm, as you would know, and so we can have an alarm, but we can also have a clock that implements the alarm interface. So this is my wonderful UML diagram here, as you can see. So this is inheritance from there, and you can have a clock. But guess what? Not only can you use a clock these days, we can use our smartphones, you can also use a computer, you can use a TV, and it can go endlessly like this. And a lot of days when I'm traveling, I'm really, really worried I may miss a flight because I oversleep. So not only do I set an alarm in my, in my I was gonna say clock, in my smartphone, but I also call my lovely wife and say, sweetie, if I don't call you at this time, call everybody in the world and ask them to call me, I don't wanna miss my flight. So we could have even, even have a human implementation of an alarm if you want to. So it's very, very extensible as you can see. So the point about dependency inversion principle is a concrete class like person should not depend on a concrete class like clock. Instead, both concrete classes, person and the clock, should now depend on the abstraction, which is the interface. It's an inversion of dependency, meaning rather than concrete depending on concrete, the two concretes now depend on an interface, and you have used dependency inversion principle if you ever used mock objects. You have used dependency inversion principle if you ever had to switch between multiple objects. Oftentimes, your code may violate open closed principle, and one way you can solve it is by applying dependency inversion principle. So I see open closed principle as something that I try not to violate. I see dependency inversion principle as something that I often use as a way not to violate. This is one of the principles I've used quite extensively. So I talked about quite a number of principles over here. These principles are pretty useful. Sometimes people use the word solid principles, but I'm not a huge fan of the word solid itself. The solid, of course, is single responsibility principle, open closed principle, Liskov suspicion principle, dependency inversion principle. This stands for interface segregation principle, which I didn't talk about. But I'm also a huge fan of other things, like the dry principle and the Yagni principle, so I want to think a lot more beyond the solid principles also. While solid is really useful, solid is not uh, enough in my opinion. We also have to think about a few other principles as well. And using these principles during tactical design has been extremely helpful. And it's also a good vocabulary to communicate among teams. I hope you would be able to use that as well. Thank you very much.